Praise the Lord. Amen. Rise up as we pray together. Let's close our eyes as we pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for our Bible study. We thank you because your spirit is always present with us. And there's no doubt in any of our hearts that today you are mightily present with us in Jesus' name. Amen. We know that as your word is coming to us, we're going to respond in a powerful, positive way in Jesus' name. Amen. Bless your people today as we study together. Amen. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you very much. You can be seated. We're in the book of Jonah. And from Jonah, I'm reading from chapter 1, reading from verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. As we look at verse 1, it says, Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah. Every time you come to the Bible study, the word of the Lord is coming to you. And you cannot be neutral to the word of God. You either respond positively or you react negatively. In the case of Jonah, he reacted negatively. The Lord had said, Arise and go to Nineveh. And the Lord described the neighbor to him, that great city. And he told him the reason why. Because their wickedness has come up before me. And it is not the will of God that anyone should die. That any sinner, any wicked man, any wicked woman, any wicked family, or any wicked city shall perish or die. Because he has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. That's why he said, arise and go to that city. And declare unto them the might of the Lord, that if they do not repent, they will perish. That's the same thing the Lord is telling you and telling me. And the Lord is saying, you too, arise and go into the city and declare the whole counsel of God. We're looking at Acts chapter 5, verse 20. Acts 5, verse 20. Go, stand, and speak in the temple to the people all the words of this life. The same commandment that came to Jonah is coming to you. The same commission that came to Jonah is coming to you. And the same imperative, a commission you cannot escape, that thing that came to Jonah is coming to you. Then we find that, as we come back to Jonah, Jonah then rose up to flee unto Tarshish, Fleeing away, running away from the presence of the Lord. How reasonable was that? Because Jonah himself said he believed in God. And that God is the maker of both earth and the sea. Heaven and the earth. How then could you run away from God? Let's refresh our memory. And let us remind ourselves... That's an impossible scene to run away from the Lord. In Psalm 139, Psalm 139, I'm reading from verse 7. Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Or whither shall I flee from thy presence? Here the psalmist asked a question. A question to you, you can be asking yourself, where will you run to? How can you ever think of fleeing? of running away, of reacting negatively to the words of the Lord. Where will you go? Whither shall I go from thy spirit? His spirit is everywhere. Whether you're in a dungeon or you're on the mountain top, whether you're in the city or you're in the village, whether you're in a private place or a public place, the spirit of the Lord is there. And then he says, so whither shall I flee? From thy presence is everywhere present. That's why one of the attributes of the Almighty God is that He is omnipresent. That means He's present everywhere. So you should be asking yourself then, whither shall I flee from thy presence? In verse 8, A, I ascend up into heaven. Thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, 
thou art there. That is, your presence is everywhere, whether up above or down below, whether far away or nearby. The Lord is everywhere present. Then it says in verse 9, if I take the wings of the morning, and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea. Even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee. Whatever we do in the dark, the Lord knows, and the Lord sees. What I will say in the dark, the Lord hears everything because he is God. If there is something you can do that he didn't know, he will not be God. If there is a place you can go that the hand of the Lord cannot reach you there, touch you there, he will not be God. He will be less than God if he's not omnipotent, if he's not omniscient, and if he's not omnipresent, he will be less than God because he is God. He has all power. Because he's God, he knows all things. And because he's God, he's everywhere present. In verse 12, Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike unto thee. In Psalm 113, Psalm 113, verses 5 and 6. Who is like unto the Lord our God, who dwelleth on high, who humbleth himself to behold the things that are done in heaven and in the earth? You want to have a better understanding of the Almighty God. He knows everything that goes on in heaven and knows everything that goes on on the earth. He humbles himself, that is, he looks down on the affairs of man, on the activities of man, on everything that man may be doing everywhere, and he beholds and he sees all the things that are done in heaven and all the things that are done on the earth. In Jeremiah chapter 23, Jeremiah chapter 23, we're looking at verse 23 and verse 24. Am I a God at hand, says the Lord, and not a God afar off? Can any hide himself in secret places that I shall not see him, says the Lord? Do not I feel heaven and earth, says the Lord. Here the Lord is asking an important question. He's asking man, the creature. And here is the creator of the almighty God asking, Is there anything that almighty God will not know? Whether it is far away or it is very near. He says, can anyone... Any man, any woman, any child, any boy, any intelligent one, any clever one, any crafty one, any deceptive man, any sinful man, any backslider, can anyone hide himself that the Almighty God will not see him, says the Lord. Do not I feel heaven and earth, says the Lord. That he is, his eyes can see everything. He beholds everything. Everything in the deep, in the dead, and everything in the height. And because he knows everything, and because he beholds everything, that's why if you are a real child of God, you have the knowledge of Scripture, you're not going to do anything in secret that you think, I think God will not know this one. I think God will not hear this one because he knows everything and he hears everything. We're told in Isaiah chapter 29. Isaiah 29, we're looking at verse 15. In Isaiah chapter 29, looking at verse 15. Here the word of God declares, Woe unto them that seek deep to hide their counsel from the Lord. One to them that seek to hide their ideas from the Lord, their plans from the Lord, their activities from the Lord, their counsel from the Lord. You see, that's what Jonah was trying to do. He was trying to hide his counsel. He was trying to hide his activity. He was trying to hide his decision from the Lord. And the Bible says, Woe unto them that seek deep to hide their counsel from the Lord. And their works are in the dark. And they say, Who seeth us? 
and who knoweth us. Of course, he knows everything. And when you try to hide anything from the Lord, it's like you don't know that God. You don't know his power, his knowledge. And you don't know his insight into all things. We're looking at Amos, Amos chapter 9. I'm reading verses 2 and 3. Amos chapter 9, verse 2. Though they dig into hell, then shall my hand take them. Though they dig very deep into hell, into the region of darkness, and into the very depths of the earth, it says, There will I my hand take them. Though they climb up to heaven, then will I bring them down. And though they hide themselves in the top of Camel, I will search and take them out there. And though they be hid from mine sight, in the bottom, in the bottom of the sea, then will I command the serpent, and it shall bite them. As we look at that last part of verse 3, and it says, Though they will go to the bottom of the sea, though they be hidden from my sight in the bottom of the sea. Isn't that what happened to Jonah? When the people were saying, what are we going to do to thee? You have just told us you are running away from God. How could you do that? What are we going to do now that the raging of the sea may be silent for us and we can have some peace and security and safety of our lives? So he said, there's one thing you can do. Pick me up. And throw me into the sea. If you will throw me into the sea, everything will be all right for you. He thought, when that was done, then he'll be free. Because he'll be in the depths of the sea. And what can the Almighty God do to him when he was in the depths of the sea? But the Almighty God says here in verse 3, it says, Though they be hid from my sight in the bottom of the sea, then will I command the serpent, and he shall bite them. Come back to Jonah. In Jonah now, we're looking at chapter 1, verse 17. You'll see now Jonah had been trying to run away from the Lord. But he wasn't successful at that. And nobody will ever be successful trying to run away from the Lord. Anywhere you run to the hand of the Lord will catch you there. And what he wants you to do, he'll see bring you back to the perfect will of the Almighty God. Jonah chapter 1 verse 17. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. As we look at uh, this, episode, uh, this uh, episode in the life of Jonah, here we learn that Jonah went through the storm. Why? Because he was trying to run away from the Lord. And everyone that tries to run away from the Lord, from the sin that the Lord lays upon you, you need to understand you are born for a purpose. God has a reason for, for, to allow you to be born. And that purpose, that reason, he must fulfill it in your life. And he will reveal it to you. The moment you become born again, the Spirit of God is striving with your heart. Here is the way to go. Here is the thing to do. Here is the way to spend your life to the glory of God. And if you shake yourself away from that, and you run away from that. And you try to avoid the will of God, the plan of God, the purpose of God, the assignment for which you were created. The Lord is going to send a storm after your life. That's why Jonah went through the storm. He was an unwilling evangelist, unwilling missionary, unwilling preacher, unwilling soul winner. But then the Lord trapped him in the great fish so that the Lord could reach down to his heart and make him willing eventually to go and preach in Nineveh. And then as we look at this, just this verse of scripture tells a lot for everyone. Number one, it tells us that God has manifold resources in his hand. And he has the resources in the sea, resources in the air, resources on the land resources in the animal kingdom and resources in the human kingdom. That is, resources among men and resources among animals. We see another thing, that God also 
demonstrates mercy in the midst of the judgment, in the midst of the rebuke, in the midst of the chastisement, in the midst of the storm, the Lord still rescued Jonah. And so you have the merciful rescue of Jonah. But beyond all that, we find the real thing here, the miraculous resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, that everything that happens, the Lord can still bring a lesson out of that thing. And that's what you find, that eventually when Jesus Christ came, he referred back to Jonah. And he said, as Jonah was in the belly of the whale of the fish, three days and three nights, even so the Son of Man will be in the depths of the earth. He'll die on the cross of Calvary, and then he'll be buried on the third day. He will rise again for our salvation. Praise the Lord. Everything that happens, whether it happens to a good man like Joseph or it happens to a bad man like Jonah, God can still get the credit out of it. The only difference is this. In the case of Joseph, he'll get a reward. In the case of Jonah, he'll get a rebuke. God can get the glory out of everything we do, whether you're a good man or you're a bad man. If you're good, if you are responsive to the Lord, and if you listen to the Lord, then God is going to get the glory out of what you have done, then he'll give you a reward. But if you are like Jonah, he will still be able to get glory out of whatever you are doing, because he can turn every negative thing, he can turn it to positive. He'll still get his glory, but instead of reward, you are going to get a rebuke. Now, if you are wise, you'll be on the right hand side. You'll be like Joseph and say, Lord, I surrender. And willingly, you'll surrender to the Lord and do what he wants you to do so that he'll get the glory and then there'll be a reward for your life in Jesus' name. We divide the study to three parts. Number one, the manifold resources of Jehovah. Number one, the manifold resources of Jehovah. Number two, the merciful rescue of Jonah. And then number three, the miraculous resurrection of Jesus. Let's come back to this again in uh, Jonah chapter 1 verse 17. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. What we're learning from this is that God had a fish that could swallow up Jonah. And yet that fish was under the control of the Almighty God. You think about it, God could have allowed Jonah to drown. But no, his purpose will not be fulfilled. God could have made that fish also to eat up Jonah. Just digest Jonah, kill him, and eat him up. But the purpose of God will not be fulfilled. And therefore, he allowed Jonah to be preserved inside that belly of the whale. Now, let's, let's run through some references of the Bible. And then you are going to see all the resources that God has at his command. At his command. And he uses everything for a particular purpose. I'm going to read this again. And I'm going to, every verse I read now, I'm going to tie each with the purpose of that resource. Of that, resource. that is of that thing that God has used. So that you will know anything God does, he has a receipt. And even whether he uses a stone, or he uses an animal, or he uses a man, he has a purpose. Let's start with Jonah chapter 1 verse 17. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. What's the purpose here? Preservation. To preserve him. Yes, he was disobedient, but he had a ministry for him. Yes, he was rebellious, but he had something for him to do. And he needed to preserve him before he'll be able to fulfill that ministry. The same thing in our lives. Whenever the Lord is maybe having controversy with us, you'll be surprised. He still preserves you. 
he still protects you because he's not through with you yet. Although he has a bone of contention to crack with you, although he has controversy against you, and yet because he knows that when he's through with you, you will have to submit to him. Therefore, he will use the resources at his command to preserve you for the moment. Therefore, we find in the case of Jonah that God used the fish for preservation. Let us now look at Judges chapter 7. Judges chapter 7, you have had the story of Gideon. And Gideon was afraid to do what the Lord had called him to do. He was willing, but he was weak. He wanted to do it, but he didn't have the experience and the knowledge. Because of that, he was weak. He didn't know whether he could overcome or not. How could I? And what is my father's house that I will go against the Midianites? How can I overcome? In Judges chapter 7, I'm reading from verse 9. Judges chapter 7 verse 9. And it came to pass the same night that the Lord said unto him, Arise and get thee down unto the host, for I have delivered each into thine hand. But if thou fear to go down, Go thou with Porah, thy servant, down to the host. That is, he was to go now to the enemy camp. That's exactly what he was afraid of. He was to fight against those enemies, but was afraid to do that. And God said, all right, you will understand that I have all the resources in my hand. And I'm going to make use of those enemies to prophesy to you. And to proclaim to you that you are going to conquer them. You see, he can use even your enemies to tell you what's his mind and what's his purpose. And what does he really have for you? In verse 11 it says, and thou shalt hear what they say. And afterward shall thine hands be strengthened to go down unto the host. Then went he down with Porah. A servant unto the outside of the arm of the armed men that were in the host, and the Midianites and the Amalekites and all the children of the east lay along in the valley like grasshoppers for multitude, and their camels were without number as a sand of the seaside for multitude. And when Gideon was come, behold, there was a man that told a dream to his fellow and said, Behold, I dreamed. I dreamed a dream. And lo, a cake of barley bread tumbled into the host of Midian and came unto a tent and smote it that it fell and overturned it and the tent lay along. And his fellow answered and said, This is nothing else save except the sword of Gideon the son of Josh, a man of Israel, for into his hand has God delivered Midian and all the host. And it was so. When Gideon heard the telling of the dream and the interpretation thereof, that he worshipped and returned into the host of Israel and said, Arise, for the Lord has delivered into your hand the host of Israel. Median. You see here the resources God uses. He even uses the unbelievers. He uses the Midianites. He uses the enemies. And then those enemies, they proclaimed and prophesied that Gideon was going to defeat them and conquer them. What was God doing? God was persuading Gideon. He uses his sources number two for persuasion. Persuasion. When Gideon was confused and when Gideon was expressing weakness and unwillingness to go because he thought he could not make it, then God used the resources from the enemy camp to grant him persuasion. I come to Joshua chapter 2. In Joshua chapter 2, you'll see there is uh, what God used here. He has in all the resources, the whole creation is in the hand of the Lord. And he can use everything and everyone to declare his mind unto us. Joshua chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 1. And Joshua, the son of Nun, sent out of Shittim two men to spy secretly, saying, Go, view the land, even Jericho. And they went and came into, the hall into an harlot's house, named Rahab, and lodged there. And it was told the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, 
there came men in hither tonight of the children of Israel to search out the country. Look at verse 6. But she had brought them up to the roof of the house and hid them with the stalks of flax which she had laid in order upon the roof. And the men pursued after them the way to Jonah unto the forts and as soon as they which pursued after were gone they shut the gate now can you see here God used this one for protection protection you see all the resources of this world they are in the hands of the Lord that's why a child of God should never be afraid afraid of anything afraid of anything that may happen you will never get into any situation in your life where god does not have something someone there to grant you the purpose of his calling and the purpose why he sent you to do what you are supposed to do whether it is for preservation or it is for persuasion or it is for protection the resources are there in the hands of the lord i'm looking at numbers chapter 22 in numbers chapter 22 we're looking at it from verse 22. Numbers chapter 22, verse 22. And God's anger was kindled because he went. And the angel of the Lord stood in the way for an adversary. That is like an enemy, an antagonist against him. Now he was riding upon his ass, and his two servants were with him. And they saw the, uh, the angel of the Lord standing in the way. See what God is doing. He used Rahab, a woman. He used a man in the uh, army of Midian. That's a man. And then he used a fish in the sea. Over here now, he's using an ass. That's what I'm telling you. There is no place you can be on the face of this earth if God wants you to do something. He has all the resources in his hand. In this case now, he's going to use a dumb ass. And then we're told in verse 23, And the ass saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way. And he saw drawn in his hand. And the ass turned aside out of the way. And went into the field. And Balaam smote the ass to turn her into the way. But the angel of the Lord stood in a pass of the vineyards, a wall being on this side and a wall on that side. And when the ass saw the angel of the Lord, she thrust herself onto the wall and crushed Balaam's foot against the wall and he smote her again. And the angel of the Lord went further and stood in a narrow place where was no way to turn either to the right hand or to the left. And when the ass saw the angel of the Lord, she fell down under Balaam. And Balaam's anger was kindled and he smote the ass with a staff. How many times we try to even angel the resources that God is using to preserve our lives? And the Lord was using the ass because otherwise that angel had a sword in the hand. I would have killed Balaam. And that ass was actually doing the best to preserve the life of Balaam. But Balaam did not have understanding. And how many times the Lord may use his own resources, a man, a woman, a Christian, a non-Christian, just to preserve you and make you to go in the direction that he wants you to go. And then you get angry against the ass. How could you do this to me? If I had a sword in my hand, I would have killed you. Look at it, verse 28. And the Lord opened the mouth of the ass, and she said unto Balaam, What have I done unto thee? Why, that thou hast meeting me these three times. And Balaam said unto the ass, Because thou hast mocked me, I would, I would, I would, there were a sword in mine hand. For now, would I, would I kill thee? And the ass said unto Balaam, I'm not higher than ass, upon which thou wast reading ever since I was, I was thine until this day. Was I ever one to do so unto thee? And he said, Nay. Then the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way. And 
a sword drawn in his hand. And he bowed down, he said, and fell flat on his face. And the angel of the Lord said unto him, Wherefore, as thou meet him, then as these three times, behold, I went out to withstand thee, because thy way is perverse before me. And the ass saw me, and turned from me these three times, unless she had turned from me. Surely now also I had slain thee, I would have slain thee, and saved her alive. Do you see what we're learning here? This is what prevention, prevention. The Lord didn't want him to go where he was going. And the Lord wanted to prevent his onward journey. And therefore, he used the ass so that he'll be cautioned, so that he will not do what he wanted to do. But although he did not listen, eventually he perished in his, uh, in his iniquity. We're looking at 1 Kings chapter 17. Manifold resources of Jehovah. That is what Jehovah has in his hand. All the things he has that he can use. And all the things he has that he still uses today one way or the other. In 1 Kings chapter 17, I'm reading from verses 3 and 4. Get thee hence, and turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the brook Cherith, that, that he is before Jordan, and it shall be that thou shalt drink of the, of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. What resources the Lord has. I've commanded the ravens to feed you there. Number five, here is for provision, for provision. That even though he'll be by the seaside, by the riverside, and then there'll be no human being to provide for him, yet God said, I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. We're looking at uh, Jeremiah chapter 25. In Jeremiah chapter 25, we're looking at verse 9. Jeremiah chapter 25, verse 9. Behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, says the Lord, and Nebuchadnezzar the king of Babylon, my servant, Nebuchadnezzar the king of Babylon, my servant, I thought, I thought uh, Babylon was uh, a place or a country, a nation of idol worship. Yes. I thought Nebuchadnezzar was an idol worshiper himself. Yes. We're talking about resources that God has. He has created everyone and he created Nebuchadnezzar. And he said, children of Israel, I've been trying to take care of you. I want to make you a special nation, but you are resisting my will. And you are not doing what I want you to do, all right? I'll show you the resources I have. I have a servant. It's one of my resources. His name is Nebuchadnezzar, the king of the Chaldeans. And I'm going to send him against you. Look at it again. Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, and will bring them against this land and against the inhabitants thereof, against all these nations round about, and will utterly destroy them and make them an, an astonishment and a hissing and perpetual desolations. He uses this one for punishment. For punishment. The resources God has, he uses all those resources for different, different kinds of things. But he has all the resources in his hand. He was going to use Nebuchadnezzar for the punishment of the people. We are now in John chapter 11. John chapter 11, the resources that God has. We are looking at it from verse 47. John 11, verse 47. Then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees a council and said, what do we? For this man doeth many miracles. If we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him, and the Romans shall come and take away both our, our place and nation. And one of them named Caiaphas, being the high priest that, that same year, said unto them, Ye know nothing at all. Now this is sinner. This is a religious sinner, but a religious sinner in a position of authority. And while the people were discussing about Jesus Christ, and then they were saying, you know, if we let this Jesus alone with all these miracles, 
is going to get everybody converted and then he will tell them be peaceful and be loving and don't fight if anybody fights you you turn the other cheek and then just be loving and if we allow this man walking miracle to teach the people not to fight then the Romans are going to come, and when the Romans come upon us, they will take our land because nobody will be ready to fight. And so then, Kafa said, you don't know anything. Look at it now, about 50. Now consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people, that the whole nation perish not. Isn't that exactly what Jesus Christ came to do? That Jesus Christ, by his death, will bring life, not only to the nation of Israel, but to the whole world. And this he spake, this spake he, not of himself, but being the high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus should die for that nation. Resources God has, this one number seven, for prophecy for prophecy. He declared a prophecy that Jesus Christ was going to die and he will die for the sins of the whole nation, for the sins of the whole world. And then we're looking at uh, Acts of the Apostles chapter 5. Acts chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 33. Acts chapter 5, verse 33. When they had that, they were caught to the heart and took counsel to slay them. The true counsel to slay, that is to kill, to destroy these apostles because they were preaching the Lord Jesus Christ and they had warned them not to do it. But they still kept on doing it, saying, we will do it because we cannot do any other thing but to obey our God. Then in verse 34, then stood there up one in the council, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a doctor of the law that arch in reputation among the people and commanded to put the apostles forth a little space and said unto them, Ye men of Israel, take heed to yourselves what ye intend to do as touching these men. For before these days rose up Tidius, uh, boasting himself to be somebody to whom a number of men, about 400, joined themselves, who were slain, and all, the, and all as many as obeyed him, and they were scattered and brought to nothing, to naught. After this rose up Judas of Galilee in the days of the taxing and drew away much people after him. He also perished and all, even as many as obeyed him, were dispersed. And now I say unto you, refrain from these men, let them alone. For if this counsel or this work be of God, be a uh, be if this counsel or this work be of men, it, shall, it will come to naught. But if it be of God, ye cannot overthrow it. Give me a good amen. amen. You see, if the work be of God, if the ministry be of God, if this church be of God, ye cannot overthrow it. I said nobody can overthrow amen. it. And then we're told, he said, Lest happily ye be found to fight against God. And to him they agreed. That's how they released those apostles. The resources that God has over here is for protection. For protection. You see, the Lord protected those apostles, and nobody could kill them or touch them because the Lord had an assignment for them. And the thing we're learning is this, that in whatever situation you find yourself, in whatever predicament you find yourself, and in whatever difficulty or challenge you find yourself, our God is still on the throne. All the resources of the earth, all the resources in the sea, all the resources in heaven, they are under his control. And he will use everything to make sure that you will be protected in Jesus' name. I come to point number two and then we're in, in Jonah again. Jonah chapter one. Jonah chapter one. We're looking at verse 17. It says, now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. The Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. Don't you know that Jonah was not, uh, that the fish was not a moment late to swallow up Jonah. 
What if uh, the fish had been waiting and then the fish had been late for about 30 minutes? It would have been drowned. It will take in so much water, it would have been dead before the fish ever came. The moment that they threw Jonah into the sea, the fish was right there. The Lord was just waiting. And that's the mercy of God. Even though the man was in rebellion, but the Lord knew his temporary rebellion. It will soon be over. The Lord knows the end from the beginning. You know, we don't know that. When you see somebody today rebellious and disobedient, a young man you think is a permanent disobedience. No, it's not. You think it's permanent rebellion. No, it's not. And God knows. And because he knew that, he will come around. He will repent. He will do my will. Even though he's doing this temporarily, I'll get him and I'll make him to do my will. So he was still providing for him. You know, that's what some backsliders don't understand. When somebody has backsliding and then he's far away from the Lord. And then the Lord does not allow him to starve to death. The Lord provides a job for him. And the Lord provides food for him. And the Lord provides protection for him. Yes, he's suffering, but he still has some basic, basic things to maintain his life. And then when we talk to him and say, why don't you turn around? Why don't you repent? Why don't you leave this thing that you are doing? There's no way in this place you are going. He says, you know, if I, if I wasn't right, I would have been dead by this time now. If I tell you testimonies, you call me a backslider. You say that I've gone astray. If I tell you, look, God did this for me. God did this for me. God did this for me. If God did all those things for me, and then you say I'm a backslider, who is a backslider? They don't understand. They don't understand that it's a merciful rescue of the Almighty God. He's doing that because he knows he will get you eventually. There is a place where a sand will catch you. Yes, you'll have food. Yes, you'll have health. Yes, you'll have a lot of other things. But there's another corner where he's waiting for you. Then you come to chapter 2 of Jonah. You will cry out and then you say, God, now I surrender. You will surrender. Now, it tells us about this Jonah, the merciful rescue of Jonah. And uh, we have seen how the Lord prepared the fish, and then the fish swallowed him up so that he will not drown, neither will he die in the sea. Isaiah chapter 54. Isaiah chapter 54. I'm reading to you from verse 7. Isaiah 54, verse 7. For a small moment have I forsaken thee, but with great mercies will I gather thee. That's what we're talking about. For a, for a brief moment, he appeared to have been forsaken. For a brief moment, when he was in the ship, when he was in that boat, and the storm was there, and it appeared everybody was going to perish for a small moment, brief moment, have I forsaken thee, but with great mercies will I gather thee. In a little wrath, I hid my face from thee for a moment, but with everlasting kindness will I have mercy on thee, says the Lord thy Redeemer. You see, it's the mercy of God that we are not destroyed. In 2 Chronicles chapter 30, verse 9. 2 Chronicles chapter 30. We're looking at verse 9. For if ye return again unto the Lord, your brethren and your children shall find compassion before them that let them captive, so that they shall come again into this land. For the Lord shall for the Lord your God is gracious and merciful. The Lord your God is gracious and merciful and will not turn away his face from you if ye return unto him. As you look at this verse and then you are thinking about Jonah. The Lord had mercy on Jonah, yet it was not without correction. Mercy was not without some restraint. Mercy. It was not without some suffering. When, he, when the storm was raging, that was suffering. And he didn't know the future. He didn't know what will actually happen. And eventually the fish swallowed him up. That was the mercy of God. But being in the whale's belly is not being the most convenient place. That's not in a palace. That's not a convenient place. That's not an easy place. And when you read the prayer that he prayed, in Jonah chapter 2, you will know, although God had mercy on him, it was mercy with some limitation. Mercy with some restriction. Because it says, if you turn again to the Lord, 
That's the condition. Although he shows you mercy to give you space to breathe and space to repent and space to examine your way and space to say, I am not in the right direction. I'm not going the right way. I think I need to change. I, need, I think I need to turn. You know, he gives you mercy just for that moment of time so you can think and turn. And then if you're not fully turned, then you see the fullness of the mercy of God. And then he will not turn away his face from you if you return unto him. And then we're told in the same second uh, Chronicles chapter 33. Second Chronicles chapter 33, we're looking at it from verse 10. And the Lord spake to Manasseh and to his people, but they would not hack him. The Lord spake to Manasseh and to the people, but they were not listen. Wherefore the Lord brought upon them the captains of the host of the king of Syria, and took Manasseh among the sons, and bound him with fetters, and carried him to Babylon. And when he was in affliction, he besought the Lord, his God, and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers. Uh, let me ask you, when something happens to you that causes you pain, that kind of pain, can that be the mercy of God at all? Oh, yes. Do you know why the people that have leprosy, do you know why their fingers are just totally cut off and they don't know? And do you know why they rub their eyes to the point that the eyelids are off and they will not know? The reason is this. The sickness of leprosy does not have pain attached with it. When you have ulcer, you have pain. When you have a sore in your leg, you have pain. When you have headache, you have pain. Because of the pain, that's why you're looking for remedy. But if a sickness comes upon you and it doesn't come with pain, like leprosy, the people, they can be rubbing their, uh, their hands on the desk, on the stone, or even a sharp uh, instrument. It will not pain them. Leprosy makes the place to be numb, that you'll not feel any pain at all. And that pain does not warn them that there's danger. And therefore, they go from bad to worse until they literally destroy themselves because there's no pain. When God allows you to have pain, that's the great mercy of God. He's telling you, he's saying, there's something happening in your stomach. And go and check up. It is a pain. You know, if somebody has sickness and there's no pain, you're not praying. You'll not see the doctor. You'll not check up anything. The pain is the mercy of God. Look at Manasseh here. You see Manasseh, he was going the wrong direction. And God knew that if I allow this man to go this direction, he'll eventually perish and go to hell. And God did not want him to go to hell, so he granted him mercy. Mercy that laid some pain on him. And then because of that pain, that's why he cried to the Lord. That's why he turned to the Lord. And you know, because we don't understand this, any little thing that is happening, for example, when the family, and your child is doing something wrong, and then as the child is doing something wrong, maybe you rebuke the child, you spank the child, and the child feels pain, and the mother feels the pain, and the mother will hold the hand of the father, don't kill this boy for me. Well, you know, when you were young, didn't you do something wrong? Leave him alone. And that child will recognize that mommy does not like me to feel pain. And when you leave that child alone like that, the child is going to go from bad to worse. Eventually, we'll find him in the prison. Let him have a present pain so that he can have a future pleasure. Let him have some pain now. There's no gain without pain. When you rebuke somebody, when you correct somebody, when you spank somebody, well, it's going to cause them pain, but it's good. That's the mercy of God. And in the case of Manasseh here, the Lord allowed him to have the pain. And it was a pain that now drove him to the Lord. That's mercy. Look at it again in verse 12. And when he was in affliction, he besought the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers and prayed unto him. And he was entreated of him and heard his supplication and brought him again unto Jerusalem into his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord, he was God. 
And then it goes on and on. All that is the mercy of God. And let's go to Jonah chapter 2 verse 8. Jonah chapter 2. We're looking at verse 8. They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. That is, there be the lies of the devil coming to you. And those lies of the devil will make you eventually to forsake the mercy of the Lord. You live carelessly. No warning, no pain, no punishment, no rebuke, no correction, no chastisement. And that's what most people want. That's human nature. Human nature does not know that you can punish somebody because you are having mercy on him. You can restrict a child because you are having mercy on that child. And you can, you know, discipline a child because actually you are having mercy on that child. And there are people that don't understand that. And because they don't understand that, they react every time. React every time. There's a little pain, a little problem, a little pressure, a little chastisement, a little correction. They react in a very negative way. They say, no, you don't love me. How do you know we don't love you? That's the love of God opposed that weep upon you. That chastises and puts that pressure and pain upon you. I pray the love of God will continue in Jesus' name. Amen. And then he tells us in the word of God, Jeremiah chapter 3. Jeremiah, I'm looking at chapter 3. In Jeremiah chapter 3, looking at verse 12. Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 12. Go and proclaim these words towards the north and say, Return, thou backsliding Israel, says the Lord. And I will not cause mine anger to fall upon you, for I am merciful. I am merciful. But you know that mercy was not flowing to them until they repented. That's why I said, go and tell them, I am merciful. The mercy is waiting for them, but I'm waiting for them to repent. And you know our children, uh, especially if you've been a teacher, like I have been all my life when I was in school. And uh, my students knew that, you know, I was, you know, born again. And I was uh, leading the, you know, scripture union group in our, in our school. And uh, any time those uh, children, when they did something wrong, and I needed to correct them, maybe I needed to tell them, now I'm going to give you, you have, you have failed the subject, and I'm going to give you what you merit. And then they say, sir, in the name of Jesus. The thing that wants to mention the name of Jesus and because of God. That you should just overlook their carelessness. I say, yes, it's because of God. I'm doing the right thing. I'm going to fail you because you failed. And I'm going to punish you because of God. I'm going to punish you. You know, people don't understand. And they, there are people even in the church, they don't understand either. You know, there are people in the church, they do something wrong. And if they, if they continue in that thing, they will go to hell and perish. And then the pastor, who is your teacher, your leader, your father in the Lord, he has to punish you. And then there will be some people in the name of God. It's because of the name of God I'm disciplining you now. <laughs> So we need to understand that, you know, it's because we believe in God. It's because we believe in Jesus. That's why we want you to repent. The mercy of God is there. And the mercy becomes available when you turn away from your sin, when you go away from evil. Go and proclaim these words towards the north. And say, return, that backsliding Israel, says the Lord, and I will not cause mine anger to fall upon you. For I am merciful, says the Lord, and I will not keep anger forever. Only acknowledge thine iniquity. Acknowledge thine iniquity. That thou hast transgressed against the Lord thy God, and hast scattered thy ways to the strangers under every green tree, and ye have not obeyed my voice, says the Lord. And then he tells us, turn to backsliding children, says the Lord, for I am married unto you, and I will take you, one of a city and two of a family, and I will bring you to Zion, and I will give you pastors according to my heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and with understanding. And let's come to Joel chapter 2. Joel chapter 2. In Joel chapter 2, we're looking at verses 12 and 13. Joel Chapter 2, reading from verse 12 and verse 13. Therefore, 
also now says the lord turn ye even to me with all your heart and with fasting and with weeping and with mourning and rend your heart and not your garments and turn unto the lord your god for he is gracious and merciful before that mercy and that grace and that compassion will come rend your heart turn away from evil and then desire the mercy of the Lord is slow to anger of great kindness and repenteth him of the evil. We're looking at Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. Reading from verse 50. And his mercy is on them that fear him. From generation to generation. His mercy is on them that fear him. His mercy is not on the people that continue in sin, the people that disregard him, disrespect him, disobey him, and will disregard his word or his demand. His mercy is upon them that fear him from generation to generation. Isaiah chapter 55. In Isaiah chapter 55, we're looking at verse 6 and verse 7. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy on him. You see what he has to do? You seek the Lord while he may be found. You call upon him while he's near. And as the wicked person, you forsake your way. You forsake your righteous thoughts. You return unto the Lord. Then he will have mercy upon him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. What, what are we saying about the mercy of God? Number one, the mercy of God punishes sinners. The mercy of God punishes sinners. It's when you have a little punishment now, then it changes your heart. You feel the pain. You turn to the Lord. Then you are able to get to heaven eventually. Number two, the mercy of God preserves souls. It's the mercy of God that preserved Jonah here. That he didn't drown. That he didn't die. The mercy of God preserves souls. Number three, the mercy of God pardons sins. The sins are forgiven. The sins are taken away. And the sins are cleansed because of the mercy of God. Number four, the mercy of God purges sons. If you're a child of God, the Lord will purge you. And the Lord will chastise you. The Lord will correct you. And that's the mercy. The mercy of God purges sons. Number five, the mercy of God purifies saints. You are a saint of God. You are born again, you are regenerated. And then is the mercy of God flowing through the blood of Jesus that purifies you. Number six, the mercy of God provides sustenance. The mercy of God provides sustenance. It does not allow you to die in your penury, in your poverty, and in your need. It provides for you because of his mercy. And then number seven, the mercy of God protects his servants. The mercy of God protects his servants. I come to point number three. And we're looking at the miraculous resurrection of Jesus Christ. We'll come back to Jonah chapter 1. In Jonah chapter 1, we're looking at verse 17. Now, the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Let's see the reference of the Lord Jesus Christ to that event in the life of Jonah. In Matthew chapter 12, Matthew chapter 12, verses 40 and 41. Matthew chapter 12, verse 40. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonas and behold, a greater than Jonas is here. You'll see that Jesus took that story in the life of uh, Jonah. He took that event in the life of Jonah. He took that thing that happened to Jonah and he applied it to himself, to his death, burial, and resurrection. In Luke chapter 11, we're looking at verse 30. Luke chapter 11, we're looking at verse 30. 
First, Jonas was a sign to the Ninevites. So also shall the Son of Man be to this generation. That tells us something then about the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm here to tell you that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is very, very important and very, very essential to your faith in the Lord and in fact to everything that you have from the Lord. Look at the message of the gospel in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, reading verses 3 and 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 and 4. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received. I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received. And that's what you ought to deliver to you. Whatever you have received, as we have, come, as we have been coming to this Bible study, line upon line, Precept upon precept. You have received it from the Lord through your teacher, through your leader, through your pastor. You go to deliver that to all the people too. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. How that Christ died for our sins. He died for our sins, according to the scriptures. And that he was, uh, and that he was buried, and that he rose again when? The third day, and it says, according to the scriptures. And you'll see the episode or the event in the life of Jonah coming right now to uh, the place where the, to Jesus Christ, he died. He was buried three days. The third day, he rose from the dead. Look at verse 14. And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith also is vain. Do you see the importance of the resurrection of Jesus? It says, if you don't believe the resurrection of Jesus Christ, then our preaching is vain. Anything we're preaching, if it doesn't have the resurrection of Jesus Christ, it's not going to have the power of the cross to make us live the way we are to live and to prepare for heaven. And it says our faith is vain. Any kind of faith you have that doesn't take the resurrection of Jesus Christ into account, that faith is not acceptable in the sight of God. Look at verse 17. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. And ye are yet in your sins. That is, if we don't believe the resurrection of Jesus Christ, there's no religion. There's no Christianity. There's no salvation. There's nothing. Let me show you. Number one, it is the resurrection of Jesus Christ that grants us repentance. Have you ever thought about that? You would say, I repented. You couldn't have repented if Almighty God did not breathe on you, impress it on you, and turn your mind to actually repent. It's not because you wanted to repent. Yes, you wanted to, but the Lord helped you. Look at Acts chapter 5, verses 30 and 31. Acts chapter 5, verse 30. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom ye slew and hanged on a tree. Him as God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. It is by that resurrection of Jesus Christ, the Father became pleased with that sacrifice and the resurrection, and now he has given repentance and forgiveness of sins. Number one, resurrection is very essential for our repentance. Number two, for our regeneration. Our regeneration. In Acts of the Apostles chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 10. Be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead. That's the resurrection again. Even by him does this man stand here before you hold. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which is become the hedge of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved because of the resurrection. That's why we have the salvation. That's why we have that regeneration. Uh, look at First Peter chapter 1, verse 3. First Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again. That's being born again. 
begotten us again, that's regeneration. Begotten us again, that's conversion. Begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. The resurrection of Jesus Christ, number one, is essential for our repentance. Number two, it's essential for our regeneration. Number three, it's essential for our righteousness. Without the resurrection of Jesus Christ, there's no way anybody can be righteous. And that resurrection is important, essential for our righteousness. Look at Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6, we're looking at it from verse 4. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up, from the dead, by the glory of the Father, even so we also shall walk in newness of life. That's righteousness. Our righteousness comes by the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. It says in verse 5, For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Chapter 7, verse 4, Wherefore, my brethren, ye also have become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. That's the fruit of righteousness. And it is hinged, it is built on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and verse 10, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, that I shall believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead. If you will believe it in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So then you understand the resurrection of Jesus Christ has granted us repentance. Number two, the resurrection of Jesus Christ has granted us regeneration, the new birth. Number three, the resurrection of Jesus Christ has granted us righteousness. Number four, that resurrection has given us renewal, renewal. In Colossians chapter 3, Colossians chapter 3, we're looking at verse 1 and verse 2. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. If ye then be risen with Christ. You see that resurrection there? If you don't accept the resurrection of Christ, you don't have anything in Christianity. You don't have anything in Christ. And that story or that event in the life of Jonah comes to tell us, illustrate for us, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is that resurrection that grants us renewal in the Lord. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ seated on the right hand of God, set to affection on things above and not on things on the earth. Number five, it gives us recovery, recovery from sickness. You see, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is not limited to an isolated, an isolated kind of doctrine, isolated kind of event. It gives us recovery, recovery from sickness. In Romans chapter 8, verse 11. Romans chapter 8, verse 11. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by a spirit that dwelleth in you. That's a recovery from sickness. When you are sick, when you are weak, when your body is undergoing some sickness and weakness or pain or disease, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the same spirit that raised up Jesus from the dead, that same spirit will raise up your body. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 8. For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble, which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure, above strength, is so much that we despaired even of life. That is, the pressure was so much upon us. The pain was unbearable. But we had the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God which raised the dead. You see that the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ was what Paul had to fall upon, to lean upon at this time of real pressure and pain and 
and pain. It says, who delivered us from so great a death and does deliver in whom we trust that he will yet deliver us because of his faith in the resurrection of the Lord. Number six, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ is essential for receiving the Holy Spirit. Essential for receiving the Holy Spirit. Maybe you never thought about that. You just thought, you know, the Holy Ghost is given, and then I receive. But the resurrection of Jesus is so essential to it. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2. We're looking at it from verse 31. Acts, chapter 2, verse 31. He's seen this before, speak of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus has God raised up, whereof we all are witnesses. Therefore, you see, therefore, it says, because of the resurrection, because Jesus died, he was buried three days, and then the third day he rose again. Because of that resurrection, therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this which he now see and hear. Baptism in the Holy Ghost, the power of the Holy Ghost, because of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Number seven, our own resurrection, our own resurrection. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is important and essential, number one, because of our repentance. Number two, because of our regeneration. Number three, because of our righteousness. Number four, because of our renewal. Number five, because of our recovery. Number six, because of our receiving the Holy Spirit. Number seven, because of our resurrection. Second Corinthians, I'm looking at verse four. Second Corinthians chapter 4, rather. Second Corinthians chapter 4. We're looking at verse 14. Knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us with you. Our own resurrection. We're waiting for our own resurrection. It says our resurrection is based on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Knowing this that he who raised up Jesus Christ from the dead, he also will raise us up by Jesus and shall present us with you. First Corinthians chapter 6, I'm looking at verse 14. First Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. And God had both raised up the Lord, and we also and will also raise us up by his own power. He has raised up Jesus Christ because he has done that. That gives us assurance that he will raise us up also. Number eight, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is essential for our rapture. Essential for our rapture. We're looking at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, we're looking at it from verse 14. For if we believe that Jesus died, and rose again. If we believe that, that Jesus died, and that he rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not precede, prevent, hinder them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, and with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise forth. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Amen. Amen. But to see that rapture there is on the basis that you recognize the resurrection of Jesus and you believe the resurrection of Jesus and you are living by the power of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. That resurrection then is very essential, very important, indispensable for you to believe for repentance, for regeneration, for righteousness, for renewal, for recovery from sickness, and for receiving the Holy Spirit for our resurrection as well as for our rapture. Let's come back to Jonah. In Jonah, we're looking at uh, 
chapter 1, Jonah chapter 1, we're looking at verse 17. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. We have learned today that God has all the resources in heaven, all the resources on earth, all the resources on the land, all the resources in the sea, all the resources among human beings in his hand, and he will protect his own. He will preserve his own. He will show his mercy. And then you don't have anything to worry about. You know that if you're in the center of the will of God, he will use all the resources he has, and it will be to your good and to your provision in Jesus' name. Amen. And as you look at the people of God in Bible days, you will find, you see, for example, think about Samson. He had just destroyed a lot of the Philistines, a lot of uh, the enemies. And then he became so thirsty. And he said, now I'm going to die of hunger. And then God showed him that jawbone of theirs that he has thrown away. And then he brought all the water that he needed, all the honey that he needed, because all those things are the resources of the Lord. And then the Lord had told uh, Peter, said, you will deny me. And he said, no, if I'm going to die with you, I will not deny you. And then he denied the Lord first time, second time, third time. And then the cock crew, just the cock, resources of the Lord. He has all those things in his hand. He can use the wind that blows. He can use the sea that rages. He can use the cock that crows. He can use the jawbone of an ass. All the resources are in the sand. And as we yield to him, using the resources, then we know it will be well with us in Jesus' name. Amen. But no, if God can use an ass, the jawbone of an ass, or a cock crowing, God can use your pastor to speak to you. It's one of the resources we have. In fact, it's one of the greatest resources in the hand of the Lord that he sends the preacher to you. He sends the teacher to you. And he says, hear the word of God. What a great thing, a great instrument that is, that you will yield to the word of the Lord. And you will not wait until all the other resources will come into play before you'll, use, before you'll yield to the Lord. Number two, we have learned about the merciful rescue of Jonah. And if God could rescue Jonah from that place where he was, no matter where you are today, the Lord can rescue you. Yeah. And the hand of the Lord will reach out to you where you are. He'll bring you out of those predicaments you have in Jesus' name. Yeah. And then the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because he lives, we also shall live. Yeah. Because Jesus Christ on the third day, he rose from the dead by the power of the almighty God himself. That same power is available today. And then the day is coming when those who are dead in the grave, they will hear the voice of the Son of Man and the people that hear, they shall rise up from the grave. On that resurrection day, when others are going to rise up to judgment and condemnation, the people of God will rise up and will rise up unto reward and unto justification. And I pray that 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 will be your Lord in Jesus' name. Amen. Because he lives, we shall live. And the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ will provide every spiritual need, everything that the Lord has promised in our lives, from repentance to regeneration to righteousness, to renewal, as well as recovery and receiving of the Holy Spirit, and then a spiritual resurrection, an eventual resurrection, and then on the final day, when the trumpet shall sound, and the dead in Christ shall rise, and we which are alive will be caught up together with them in the clouds and will experience the rapture. I pray that you will be there yeah. on the basis that you believe the resurrection of Christ and you allow that resurrection to work in your life. We shall be together on that day. Yeah. Let's rise up and pray to the Lord. All the things you have heard will pray about them. You rise up and pray. And this prayer time is essential time, important time. There's nothing to be in a hurry about. We want to pray. You pray with your spirit. You pray with your soul. Everything that you have had today, you take it to the Lord in prayer. You say, Lord, I want to experience your mercy. And I want to see your hand in everything. I want to see your mercy in everything. Even when something is causing me pain, I want to see it in the mercy of God. 
I want to see it is the mercy of God. I want to see that you are dealing with me in your mercy. Oh Lord, here am I. I yield myself unto you. Open your mouth and pray. What has the Lord been using in your life? Is the Lord using your husband to talk to you? Is the Lord using your wife to talk to you? Is the Lord using a member of the church to talk to you? Is the Lord using your circumstance to talk to you? Is the Lord using some events in your life to talk to you? Is the Lord using that joblessness to talk to you? Is the Lord using the prosperity to talk to you? Is the Lord using discipline in the church to talk to you? Is the Lord using the correction, the chastisement to talk to you? Whatever the Lord is using to talk to you, respond. Don't react negatively. Respond in a positive way. Oh Lord, here I am. I am ready to hear your word. And I'm ready to go the direction you are leading me. Lord, here I am. He used all those resources to bring the people back. When God was using the ass to preserve and prevent Balaam, he said of Balaam responding positively, he was mighty and striking the ass. And yet that was the resource that the Lord was using at that time to recall him, to recall him to the way of repentance and to recall him to the way of rectitude, to the way of righteousness. Don't smite the ass. Don't grumble against the resources the Lord is using to restore you. Don't fight, don't strive. Maybe discipline, accept it. Rebuke, accept it. Chastisement, accept it. Pressure, accept it. Pain, respond to the Lord. And say, Lord, I know what you are doing. I disobeyed you. I rebelled against you. Now you are using this to recall me and to call me back to repentance. Oh Lord, I'm yielding to you today. I'm surrendering to you today. Are you backsliding? Tell the Lord you are sorry and come back from your path of backsliding. If the Lord is correcting you for disobedience, another item of disobedience will not stop the correction if the Lord is correcting you for rebellion fleeing away from the Lord fleeing further away from the Lord and rebelling further from a uh, rebelling further against the Lord will not remove the chastisement of the Lord one sin does not cause another sin to be forgiven. If you committed sin number one, and God is rebuking you for sin number one, if you go into sin number two, that's not going to make God to forgive you sin number one. It's repentance that will grant you forgiveness. Opening your heart to the Lord, opening your mind to the Lord, yielding unto the Lord, that's what will bring the forgiveness and the salvation and the restoration the Lord is merciful if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves will pray and will seek my face and will turn from their wicked ways then I will forgive their sin I will heal their land the healing comes after repentance the forgiveness comes after repentance Israel could not change the standard of God by their perpetual backsliding so don't ever think by perpetually backsliding perpetually rebelling perpetually sinning eventually I will change God Israel did not change God by their perpetual backsliding it is by returning to the Lord. That's how we're going to have mercy. It's by turning with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind unto the Lord. That's how we're going to have the mercy of God. If the Lord is chastising you, correcting you, 
for anything. Just say, Lord, I respond. Lord, I yield myself to you. Lord, I am sorry. You don't have to go into the wells barely before you turn. You don't have to go as far as Jonah before you repent. Today, if you will hear his voice, adding not your heart, as in the day of provocation, when he tempted him 40 years in the wilderness. Turn before it's too late. Repent before it's too late. Yield completely unto the Lord before it's too late. And then we have a merciful rest a restoration. Then we have a merciful rescue. Then we have the merciful touch of the Lord at our repentance, at our yieldedness to the Lord. After we say, Lord, I will stay in the center of the will of God. Lord, I've heard your voice. I've heard your word. I will no more flee. Away from the will of God. I will no more flee. Away from obedience to the great commission. Lord, I yield. Lord, I surrender. Lord, I give myself to you. If you are living in secret sin, confess it to the Lord and turn away from the secret sin. Then you have the mercy of God and that mercy will lead you to repentance. That mercy will lead you to restoration. That mercy will lead you to righteousness. That mercy will lead you to a new life, a new life in Christ. Turn to the Lord with all your heart. Rend your hearts and not your garments. Call upon the Lord your God. Be as tender as a little child. Don't let your repentance be like the repentance of Pharaoh. One moment, I'll let the children of Israel go. The next moment, he has changed his mind. Don't let your repentance be like the repentance of Saul. Not permanent not real not dependable let your repentance be genuine the repentance that ushers you to new kinds of life a new lifestyle righteousness uprightness truthfulness real redemption You have heard about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Believe that resurrection. Look unto Christ, the risen one. And that is what will lead you to genuine repentance. You look unto Christ, who rose from the dead. And he rose by the power of the Almighty God. And when you believe in that resurrection of Jesus Christ with all your heart, and you believe it wholeheartedly, that faith in the resurrection of Christ will grant you heaven sent repentance. That's what will perform the miracle of regeneration in your heart. The miracle of the new birth. The miracle of becoming a new creature. The miracle of having a new nature in you. The old self will die and be buried. Then the nature of Christ in your life, a new creation, will come in your life. Regeneration. Because of your faith in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That faith in the resurrection, the resurrection of the Lord will grant you the righteousness of God. The righteousness which comes by faith.
to grant you renewal. If you are risen with Christ, you'll seek those things which are above, where Christ is seated on the right hand of God. Your faith in the resurrection of Jesus Christ will grant you the heart and the mind to seek those things which are above. You'll set your affections on things on earth, on things in heaven, not on things on earth. To change your mind, change your heart, change your spirit, change the direction in which you are going. It will change your focus and change your desires in life. You'll desire heavenly things. You seek the kingdom of God first and his righteousness. And the power of his resurrection will work mightily in your heart, mightily in your life. And if you are sick, the resurrection power of Christ will grant you recovery from the sickness. Total healing. Complete healing. Whether it's disease or depression or the agents of death, when the resurrection power of Christ enters into you, that spirit and power of resurrection will work mightily in your life, granting you total, complete recovery. You're saved through the power of that resurrection. You're sanctified. I mean, a renewed nature through that power of the resurrection. And you receive the power, the baptism in the Holy Ghost by your faith in that resurrection. And on that glorious morning of resurrection, as you believe on the resurrection of Jesus Christ, if you die before the rapture, that's what will give you the privilege that when the saints are rising up, you also will rise with them. When the dead are raised, then those of us who are alive we shall be caught up together with them in the clouds, ever to be with the Lord. If you have hope in that rapture, you must believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ right here today. Every day you live, every day you move, with the consciousness now, whatever challenge the day may pose, the resources of Jehovah are manifold. And the rescue, the reality of the dealing of God with you, will be merciful. Then you are going to experience all the time the miracle walking resurrection power of Jesus in your life. 